Hello and welcome to The Mind of Steel. This is the weekly delve into the wacky and wonderful world of Britain's most ludicrous conspiracy theorist. This week, the great man dropped a, a mother load of information. He produced a video purporting to explain exactly what 5G is, and Mark Steele claims to be an expert in that subject. So, in order to further our own education, I invited three electronic engineers, three people that I know and trust with backgrounds in electronics, computing and telecommunications, to weigh in on the informational content of Mark Steele's proclamations. So please, sit yourself down, and I'd like to introduce you to Michael, Chris and Lee, the three electronic engineers who are going to guide us through this important and informational release. Well, what is 5G? Well, at a time when 2024 now, what is 5G? Do we really need to ask? Expert number one, MC Toon. Tell me, uh, what do you think 5G is and what is your qualification to, uh, to make such a, a bombastic pronouncement? I studied electrical engineering at university, though I, I am not an, a practicing electrical engineer. Um, so I just I have a background in it and I have an interest in it. So what is 5G? Well, 5G is just the uh, the marketing term given to specification number 15 from the 3GPP organization, um, which is essentially a collection of new features that were in 15 that were not in 14. and. And uh, they continued in release 16 and 17. So uh, of the features are expanding the available bandwidth for use, um, a bunch of protocol changes that aren't really important to the end user. So that's essentially 5G, uh, my understanding of it. If, if they had chosen not to call it 5G, it would have just been the, the, the next specification update. And they could have called it whatever they wanted or not given it any name at all. Are you a weapons expert by any chance, MC2? Uh, I, I am not a weapons expert. Lee, who are you? What is your qualification to answer this question? And what do you think 5G is? I am Lee. Um, my qualifications, so my background is in internet engineering. So I built lots of big IP networks around the world. And then about 2001, I started building mobile networks. And I actually uh, built the network that launched the first commercial uh, mobile data service and the first commercial 4G network in the UK. So I have a, a good background in mobile engineering. Uh, but more importantly, as far as 5G is concerned, I have a, a background in mobile network standards as well. So I work with um, organizations such as the WiMAX Forum and the Free GPP. So I know about how these kind of standards and, and how these things come about. So what 5G actually is, is it, it's a set of documents. And the documents uh, are written by a body of people from all sorts of different companies. So I think there's about 1,000 companies uh, represented in the free GPP. Uh, there are probably tens of thousands of people that work on these standards. And the free GPP get together and have these big meetings and they have lots of different people that represent different parts of the mobile network from security to the core network to how the actual radio interface works. And they all get together in these big meetings uh, that are really, really boring. And they write these documents that define the standards, the global standards for these things like 4G, 3G, and of course, 5G. And it's really important because, you know, you want to be able to take your phone, like this phone here, uh, from where you live. And if you go to another country, you want it to just work. Well, I find standards that a works. very far-fetched story, given that you also aren't a weapons expert. The only bit I heard from Lee's intro I, I am. was that he basically works for the Chinese Communist Party and is, is here to kill us all. Chris, tell us about who you are, uh, what is your qualification to answer this question, and what do you think 5G is? Okay, my name's Chris, you should probably guess, because you've introduced me as Chris. Um, I'm a dabbler in many things. But my training is electronics engineering, physics and chemistry. Uh, a little bit of geology, which is probably not that relevant until you start putting radio mass on the wrong side of a hill. Um, in terms of what 5G is, I kind of got a little bit of a head start there because my father's one of the design engineers for 3G and 4G. So I've got a fairly good idea what it is. But to me, 5G is a communications protocol that lets you look at cat videos. 
So now we've established the evil credentials of Bar Electronic Engineers, um, we'd like to play the first clip from Mark Steele. Uh, and uh, I want you to, to just react to it in, in the way that, uh, that you might naturally do as a certified evil electronic engineer who opposes Mark Steele. First and foremost, we'll have a base. We need a base. We need a reference point. So this is 1G, 2G, 3G, and 4G must, which basically 3G, 4G is the is the main must there. Now the rest have fell away. And closest to these uh these must, so you've got a value on the bottom in meters. So the closer you are to a must, the increase in death. And this is 4G. Okay, so the closer you get to your must. It goes up to about a thousand meters and then it drops off to the natural number, right? The general mortality rate in the general population. However, what's not spoken about is the sickness in ill health because electromagnetic radiation is an immune system suppressor. So if you're going to get the flu, it's going to get worse. If you're going to get pneumonia, it's going to be worse. If whatever you have to those musts. Absolutely horrifying, isn't it? What, what do you think Mark Steele is, is trying to say there? He's uh, he's trying to to tell people uh, that if you live close to a a, a mast, that uh, that it's less healthy for you. But I see uh, a graph that that very closely matches the population distribution of people in their relation to how close they are to a mast in general. So uh, I think that uh, higher, denser population centers have people living closer to masts anyway. So I think it's a perfect correlation between how uh, how densely populated the area is and how far you are from a mast. Strange graph, because it seems to say that there's 45 deaths per 10,000 when you're close to a mast. Is that right? It, it does. Yeah. Can you go back and just, just pause it, show, reveal the graph again, please? It's... Uh... The, it's purporting to show what well, the blue line is mortality, but for but for something in particular, neoplasia. Neoplasia, I, I believe, is sort of uh, it means tumors approximately. So it, so cancers might be kinds of neoplasia, but not all neoplasias are cancers. But but the strange thing is, well, it, it's saying that the that people who live nine hundred meters away from uh, a cell tower are slightly more likely to die of neoplasia. Yeah, in, in, an, in an industrialized country like the United Kingdom, probably 90% of people live within 900 meters of yeah, a I don't know a how they got the tower. baseline. How did they so, control so, so, for that? in London, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's I mean, about 53,000 towers, uh, mobile towers in the UK. Uh, probably almost all have, this is 4G, they almost all have 4G. So, so I, I don't see the national death statistics actually correlate with this graph at all. So I live approximately 200 meters from a 5G enabled cell phone tower. And if this statistic were true, so that would be, uh, we've got that approximately 40. So uh, I, I, should be no, I should know a handful of people who have died of neoplasia in my area. It doesn't seem to ring true, does it? Hmm. Uh, what is, I, it doesn't, doesn't work either because there's this flat blue line, which is the general population, but the red line doesn't seem to go below that. So that means everybody is more likely to die anyway than the general population. But then where, how does the baseline exist? If that's, where does the baseline come from? Yeah. How did, how did they control that confounding mm. variable? Did they find people <clears throat> who live more than one kilometer from a cell phone tower? So that probably means people who live in the countryside. But but that's not general population. Uh, going back full circle now, what this chart basically means is perhaps people who live in the rural idyllic parts of the country, whichever country this was, uh, this is supposed to be describing, live lives that are relatively free of neoplasia compared to people who live in very built up areas. So, so areas that don't have as much uh, air pollution, for example, uh, maybe not as big in busy lifestyles. Well, should we see if Mark 
uh, mentions that there could be other factors that cause uh, neoplasia, such as air pollution or other sort of environmental stresses. Which yeah. we take a bet on whether he yeah, mentions good. that or not. I, I, I think the safe bet is he doesn't. So let's now talk about 5G. So here we have your 4G transmitter operates in verse square law, and at a thousand meters, these levels of radiation are infinitesimally small, as you can imagine, operating on inverse square law. So infinitesimally small, and but at 30 mile, I can still get a signal from this mast. All right. Now I'll get a little bit more put on my mobile device to do the connection. However, I'll still get ear, ear emission to that mast at about 30 men. Obviously, it depends on the environment, you know, rain, smog, and all the rest of it. There's a number of environmental factors, but I can basically, so I can get to an infinitesimally small amount of radiation from this mast, and I can still get a signal from my device. Okay. Now, 5G, something completely different. The antenna design, this is the IEE, by the way, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. So their definition of 5G is beam forming an antenna that can focus a signal at a target. So we, we have um, a handy definition of 5G as beam forming so that it can focus a targeted signal at a target. Did he provide a citation for the IEEE uh, defining it that way? Oh, well, well I just uh, had a look. Uh, the IEEE defines 5G as the next generation of radio systems and network architecture that delivers extreme broadband, ultra robust, low latency connectivity, and massive networking for the Internet of Things. Doesn't mention beam forming at all. Uh, okay, so he, he has provided a definition mm -hmm. of 5G that, that the IEEE does not... Uh, use and assigned it to the IEEE, and I always find it funny that he doesn't call it the IEEE like everybody in the industry does. He calls it the IEE. -E. Yeah. Could we humor Mark for a moment? What exactly is beam forming? So, so beam forming is um, if you imagine you drop a a pebble uh, into a still swimming pool, and you'll see the waves go out from the pebble. Uh, so these waves are like like the first picture there you have of the, the 4G antenna. You have the 4G antenna and the waves propagate out from the antenna. Uh, so they go in all directions, and wherever you are within radius of that antenna, you 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 get some sort of signal. Uh, that, of course, is really wasteful because it means you're transmitting a signal uh, to places where there's nobody who's actually using your, your 4G network. It's a bit silly. And uh, so it, what... it increases the exposure for people that are not intent on receiving it. Yes, because there's no way to control where the signal goes. You can't direct it to uh, to where your customers actually are, wherever you're using the mobile phones. But now, if you have um, that same pebble you drop into a, a swimming pool and you drop lots of pebbles in at just the right time, you can make it so that rather than just having those concentric circles that go out uh, from that single pebble, all the circles go out and they make, make a high point, like a bigger wave at one certain point. And that little point there where that bigger wave happens is where you want your bigger signal to be. So you see there's more antennas on the 5G there. Those more antennas are uh, analogous to those multiple pebbles being dropped into the into the pool. So if you time your signals just right on all those antennas, then what you end up with is a, a stronger signal where you have the mobile receiver, your little, little device you have, or whatever you happen to have, uh, than anywhere else. Not massively higher, you might get sort of, 10, 15 dB increase, which, you know, it's, it's just good. It's really good in radio terms. It's not like you're going to fry or anything. But what it means is that in the other areas, you have a lower signal. So all it really is is a way of manipulating the antennas a bit so that the signal goes where you want it rather than everywhere. When we have these pictures here, you have those little lines, um, those sort of like pencil-like laser lines. That's not what it is like at all. Um, that's just a cartoony way of saying that in general, you want your signal to go to this car because that's where your person is with their phone. Uh, in actual fact, it's a lot more complex than that. And it, it's sort of quite big lobes of signal that go in the general direction you want it to go into. So if we were interpreting this cartoon literally, the lines on the left never seem to go anywhere, do they? They just go right back to the, uh, the receiver. <laughs> um, Probably why Mark Steele prefers 4G to 5G. Oh, yeah. I think it's important to, to uh, make it clear that... Uh, the, the network is is uh, self 
adjusting so that it's always uh, increasing or decreasing the amount of signal sent out to the device so that in 4G, it knows the person, say, that's a, a kilometer away is is farther than the person that's uh, 200 meters away. So the, the tower needs to send a more powerful signal. Yes. The receiver needs to get a certain amount. And so it will send that certain amount. And so everybody at one kilometer away will receive enough for the one person that's in one direction. Whereas the 5G, it's able to send just the same amount that is received by the person that's one kilometer away, but everybody else doesn't get that same amount. They get significantly less. It's much, much safer because nobody else gets that uh, that exposure. So Mark okay. talks about the, 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 the 4G going, he had said 30 miles, didn't he? But um, he seems to think that, he says that with the 4G, he can get uh, an infinitesimally small signal 30 miles away. I mean, that's a, that's a long way. That's a long way. You know, if you've got a good antenna on your on, on your, your phone, you might be able to do that. Uh, but 30 miles is a long way, and you'd need quite a strong signal from the base station to do that. Well, I, I don't think anyone would do that, unless you're well, like let's in, the, imagine, in the desert. Let's, let's take him at his word for a moment and imagine that a 4G tower could transmit with enough power to get 30 miles away. Everybody that's within 200 meters of that tower is getting a large exposure, and the person, so that the person that's in inverse square law, he mentioned that's 30 miles yeah. away gets just that infinitesimal amount. So the people that are nearby are getting way, way more exposure than if you did the same type of thing with a beam forming. If anything, Mark seems to be making a very strong case why we need a more efficient radio transmission system based on <laughs> larger numbers of smaller antenna. Great idea. You've got this beam form technology which here's an image in Liverpool. You've got three of these 5G transmitters together. Here's some more of the paraphernalia. This one's beamed at the ground. You'll find several elements, right? You could have 30, 40, 50, 60 elements in there beaming, offset the signal at a target. Same as these, all right? Some of this is will be telecommunications and some of it's actually 5G. You'll see how I do and put the two together. So what I think Mark Steele is sort of hinting at here is that there are two things going on in these transmitters. He thinks some of them are genuinely telecommunications devices used to link up mobile phones with their networks. But he's also suggesting that mixed in with these, uh, these legitimate communications devices are weapons deadly weapons masquerading as 5G sector antenna. And and that, I suppose, is based on his previous incorrect uh, understanding of what 5G is. Um, I mean, he, he's right that uh, there are three masts on the, on one side and that there are some on the other side. The one pointing to, the points down a bit, that is a, a typical strategy uh, that using radio planning, when you see antennas pointed down a bit, it means you're trying to limit the range a bit. Uh, so rather than having it point straight out like that uh, to get the signal to go quite a long way, you point it down a little bit, you, you angle it down so that it covers a smaller area. If you need to create a densely compact kill grid to murder more people in a precisely defined area, you, you angle it down. Is that basically what you're saying? That, that's right, so. yes. It allows you to focus your cat videos on a, on a, a more localised area. Well, I mean, obviously we're going to beam it to the ground because, you know, as far as I know, most people with mobile phones are on the ground. Um, yeah, beam forming. I mean, we've been beam forming radio since, I don't know, the 1920s? When did Yagi antennas come out? Well, yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, you know, and also, yeah. if you see multiple transmitters at AM radio stations, that's mm -hmm. usually it's going to be beam forming because you want to send your transmissions to the country, part of the country you want to cover. So that's, that's basically informing as well. Yeah, I mean, it's the 50 to 60 elements in there. Well, without taking the cover off, we couldn't actually say, but so it's 50, 60, so what? It's, the thing about beam forming is you don't like waste huge amounts of power spraying it all over the place. You can like, you know, reduce your power and have a quite a nice tight beam to wherever it is you're, you know, your your, your receiving antenna is going to be. And it also lets you capture them radiation more efficiently as well because remember these are two-way 
So you've got a beam yeah. forming antenna, it will capture it the other way, which means you less less power being transmitted. And that's the point that matters because, you know, most phones use it next to your head. I don't care about 50 watts up in the sky. I probably get quite worried to an extent about 50 watts up near my ear because my ear will get hot. Here we have these large MIMO 5G transmitters beaming to at our targets on the ground. Okay. Here we have Nokia's document, which states clearly, right, thousands of customers can be serviced, right, in the sub gig 800 megahertz spectrum, right, and we have 868 were found in the street furniture part of the micro 5G network, hundreds of square miles. So you've got hundreds of square miles footprint with just one tower. Wait, did he say 868 megahertz there? He did, yes. That's license free, isn't it? It is. Uh, it's license. And you look at the, the Ofcom spectrum map, uh, 868 megahertz is uh, intended for low power devices. Yeah, like, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, low power devices, non-specific, non -specific short range. It, isn't that the scientific range. communications band? It's it's un ISM. So you, what's what's the correct term for it? Industrial scientific and medical ISM bands. Right. Yeah. Uh, it uh, also has a, a max duty cycle. That's right. So, so you can't use it for five G because you can it's, transmit for like one percent of the time. Uh, it's expressly prohibited by law right. from using it for five G. Mm. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, it's like 433 megs, which is um, unfortunately shown in the amateur bands, but that's used for like car remotes and garage yes. door remotes and plant waters and things like that. Indeed. Uh, Mark mentions that, that um, Nokia's documents specifically say it can be used to serve thousands of customers. Um, well, yes. That that's thousands awesome. of garage door openers. I seem to recall 868 is one that well, you know, well, street actually well, uses as well. But Nokia is not talking about 868. They're talking about whatever whatever licensed spectrum that's not 868 that that they're, uh, you know, a cell provider might have been granted. Yes. Well, it's yeah, they're well, talking about the 800 meg band, which is the stuff that yeah. they removed off TV after the analog switch off, of course. That's what the whole idea of this is for rural broadband. So if you're in the middle of Wales somewhere uh, and it's just too expensive to deliver fibre to everyone's door because, you know, the houses are, are maybe a mile apart, uh, then you use those lower, uh, lower frequency bands because they propagate a bit further. Uh, and you can put a base station on a, a large hill somewhere and you can cover enough properties, uh, maybe thousands of properties, thousands of customers, and you can deliver them a usable broadband service. Uh, it says, you know, hundreds of square miles. Well, that isn't much. Uh, so 10, 10 miles, miles by sun. 10 miles. <laughs> that's it's a 10 mile by 10 mile grid. That's hundreds of hundreds of square miles. And you can serve all those customers in the area with one base station. And that's a good idea. Yeah, and if you use beamforming, then then the people that are not currently receiving a signal will get significantly less exposure than if it was just a a uh, omnidirectional yes. or a, or a sector mm -hmm. antenna. Well, to be honest, if you were building something like that, I would probably put Yagi's pointing at these sorts of like clusters because you're gonna have small clusters of little hamlets dotted around. You don't even need to do yes. beamforming; you just, you just put them. Um, you know, a reasonably high gain antenna. Are you suggesting that these companies should in fact use a high gain directional antenna? Yes, it makes perfect economic sense. Uh, it's interesting to see what he underlines in red here. I see red is the, mm. um, the color to underline things in. Uh, low band spectrum does make it easier for the wireless signal to penetrate windows and walls. Well, well yes, because Typically, people have these, these little 5G modems they stick on their desk, uh, like where you put your DSL modem, and they don't want to put antennas outside. It's expensive to do that. Uh, they might not be allowed to. It's a preservation area. So they want to have a signal that would get through the walls to some extent and the window apertures uh, so they can provide a service. And, and again, that reduces exposure because if it was a higher frequency, they would have to increase the output to get it to that same device. And all of the people that were nearby the tower would get more exposure. You know, it's funny that I don't think I ever recall Mark Steele complaining about these sub gigahertz bands being used for communications when they were used for old analog TV. And now that they've been reassigned to 5G, he seems to be really hot and bothered about it, despite the, the size of these transmitters being well, much, much smaller. There used to be... I mean, the the, the um, Sutton Caulfield transmitter was a um, uh, TV transmitter. I, I, I think that was knocking on a megawatt. It was a megawatt. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah. that's a million yeah. watts ERP, and people lived around that um, for decades. I mean, mm. if you can look literally that way, I can see the top of the Emily Moore mast. And when that was on analog, that was 860 um, kilowatts. And it's about, what, four, five miles away? I live two kilometres away from the Alexandra Palace transmitter in North London. I'm so which still... you've got any hair left. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I've, I have survived. I've even drank a beer in the pub that is adjacent to the transmitter facility. Uh, don't ask me. I must be made of even stronger stuff than Mark Steele. Now, the thing about it is, Mark... He latches onto the, oh, it's all about the gigahertz and the frequencies and so forth because they're big numbers and big numbers are scary. But Mark just doesn't understand what the frequency actually means and what the effect of increasing, you know, the M frequency is. And it reduces in, results in less penetration through solid objects like walls, um, even windows to a certain extent, mm. but very high frequencies. You know, up in the 24 and 40 gigahertz there, it becomes a problem getting through glass, especially... If so I'm just going to say it straight out. If you think that looks like a street light, you've got mental health issues. Here we have the uh, the infrastructure where we're causing a beam in air. Now, we have to remember, if for that beam in air, if I get enough stacked photons in air, over about 10 electron, 10, 13 electron volts, sometimes a little bit less than that, depending on environmental factors, and spectrum, etc., you can cause ionization in air. Well, now we all know that ionizing radiation is dangerous. All know it's dangerous, right? And that roughly comes at about 10 electron volts. ICNERB's guideline, ICNERB's guideline is 61. It's 61 electron volts. So it's nearly six times over. This is ridiculous. Of course. Oh, he, he is confusing electron volts with volts per meter. They're completely different yes. units. Uh, he, electron mm. volts is a, is a measurement of, of uh, the, the, uh, the energy in a photon. I actually <laughs> looked up what would be the, uh, the <clears throat> energy of a photon in, uh, let's say, 866 megahertz radiation. Yes. And it turns out it's, it's about... Um, 10 to the minus 6 electron volts. It's a very small amount of energy. Yeah, it's, yeah, uh, it, it's the, the Einstein-Planck equation. Yeah. And then if you, um, if, you, if you compare that with, say, visible light, so red visible light is about 1.5 electron volts, yes. and blue visible light would be about 3 electron volts per photon. So electron volts is a measure of energy, the amount of energy per quanta. So... What is the ICNIRP specification about? That's the other thing, because he's talking about the ICNIRP, the the, the maximum allowed uh, thing. He says 61. Mm. It's not 61 electron volts. It's 61 volts per meter. Yeah, the actual ICNIRP specification yeah, for the USA and Japan, as I recall, it's slightly different here, is, as I recall, 10 watts per square meter. No, it's, no, no, no he's looking at a different thing. 61 well, volts per meter. It's not watts. Yeah. It's volts per meter. Is it's different. To ionize um, air, you need about a kilowatt uh, per centimeter squared to actually yeah. ionize air. Uh, you're not I, look at that, that little tiny antenna, uh, that little silver disc thing. First, it, it is not a beam forming antenna because he already said that beam forming antennas have thousands or well, tens, hundreds of elements. Mm. That's a single element, so it, it right. isn't beam forming, and it isn't a thousand watts. Well, it's also he, he thinks it's a thousand watts because there is a relay on it. Here we have a Telenza unit. It's got an aperture in the plate lens here. It has a four quality. What's really concerned about this bit of hardware, it's got a super capacitor here. It has a relay, a 3,300 watt. It's basically a switch. So I can switch on and off and beam down there, pulse modulated emission, probably a little bit less than the 3,300 watts. But that's quite a large amount of power. This is the equipment I got removed from Gateshead. High gain, dielectric lens, got a small teardrop on the end. Um, so he he called it, he said it's got an aperture as if it's uh does he mean the you notch? know folk? I think yeah, I think that he means I think he's imagining that 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 the notch there is where it's aiming. And I think it, you'll find it's the opposite, that there's yeah. a there's a uh, drop also, off. In yeah, there, but it's not gonna be the big. Fixed. So how would you change where it aims? It's always gonna aim if it was aiming, it's always gonna aim the same direction. Yeah, the random direction that the installer drops it on the yeah. top of the, the thing. Pretty uh, much. 
I mean, he's yeah. talking about that being a, a three kilowatt relay, and he's correct. I've used those relays. Um, and the three kilowatts, if you put 250 volts through them, but mm. if you look at that thing that he calls a super capacitor, I can see that that's marked at 3.6 volts. So there's no well, way... That's, putting... that's probably the coil voltage. Um, I don't know what that's the capacitor's that, for, to be honest. Oh, oh yeah, the, the capacitor's 3.6 volts, yeah. but yeah. So I have one of these Talenza units. Uh, the relay switches um, a mains output on, on the cable from the back of it, which goes to the light. So the relay is not actually connected to the antenna at all no. or to the supercapacitor. Uh, the supercapacitor is there so that if there's a power failure, it can send what's called a dying gasp, so a, a, a signal to say, oh, my power's failed. It's a directional beam wave, right? It shoots waves at targets, and you, trying to measure them would be like looking for a needle in a haystack. What I can tell you, at 10 electron volts, it's ionizing radiation in air, not non-ionizing radiation, even though it operates non-ionizing radiation spectrum. It's how a laser cuts stainless steel. That's non-ionizing. Cuts straight through stainless steel. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Well, there he gets the electron volts things mixed up again, and, and lasers are optical, but uh, it's heat. It's not ionization that's cutting. It ionizes the air, and therefore it's ionizing radiation. But it, they have nothing to do with oh. each other. No. Uh, the laser cutters for steel are carbon dioxide lasers. They're infrared. So there's no visible light component to it whatsoever. They put a visible light laser on there so you can see where the beam is. You don't stick your finger into it. Did you notice Mark's saying... It's like finding a needle in a haystack. And I think that's now an important way that he's hedging his claims just a bit, because I, I think he's worried that yeah. people have tried to measure 5G and found that it isn't harmful. Mm. So what yeah, he's basically lower. saying is, yeah, what he's basically saying is, well, what you're measuring isn't the real 5G. You're, you're measuring the, the, the harmless or relatively harmless radiation that's bundled with it or that's, that's sort of the, the cover for the real 5G. So he's really made the case that it's safer because the people, because if you can't measure an increase in exposure, then the people there aren't receiving an increase in exposure. So good job, Mark. You have you have defeated yourself. I'd also like to point out, if you look carefully at the bit that's underlined there that shoots rays, that finishes with a comma, not a full stop. Oh, yeah. He, he... The reason is he's clipped part off that out there. I remember seeing this when it came out. Yes. And it was also talking about, I think it sprays gases and roars like a tiger. Yeah. They have things installed on it yeah. to scare the, the wildlife away. Well, it's not the 5G Mark... that's doing it. Why has he removed that? That's just plain. That's just it's plain. A, it's not it's, it's, plain. it's a lie. Yeah. yeah. It, it's part of his but marketing yeah, so that he lie. can scare people. It's a lie because it is. He thinks nobody will bother to check up on him. Well, none of the people that are scared by his tact tactics will. No. He's safe there. Uh, and also, yeah. you know, people do call him out. He, he silences them because you could never respond to any of his videos. Yeah. He, he bans you on uh, on YouTube and Facebook. So there's never any any comeback on what he says. He curates a perfect echo chamber. Yeah. Uh, willful, well, it's willful ignorance or just silliness. I'm not really sure. But outrageous saying that 5G must seem to be safe when you've got a spectrum analyzer and you're metering them at the base. Nothing could be further from the truth. Havana syndrome likely caused by pulse microwave energy. CIA operatives uh, over the years have been attacked uh, with these directional weapon systems. They're so sophisticated, hard to see. Consequently, uh, US assets attacked, possibly by that one side, uh, to test the weapons. Because I wouldn't be surprised at all. I mean, it's a bit of a cover, isn't it? You attack your own, uh, your own diplomats. Now, that, that would be quite handy uh, with your electrical weapons programs. So that would be quite handy if the CIA were able to use 5G to permanently debilitate and injure their own American diplomats. I'm sure that's exactly what is going on. And 5G is the, the mechanism by which uh, America's uh, State Department is is hurting its own people. Well, you might know this one better than me too, but I thought the Jason study had reported back that it was likely a psychosomatic illness or group hysteria. Yeah, that. But but the the you know, 
it's a good point. You you could injure people if you had a significantly high power microwave aimed at them over oh, yeah. a long amount of time. Yeah. And and so the Havana syndrome is is hypothesized to be right. caused by that and hypothesized to be caused by other things, but it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. You'd need evidence for it. But it it's you could do that. But it's all of those things are illegal. And he has already stated that you cannot measure that. You cannot identify this happening near 5G antennas. So he's he's already ruled out that possibility. I mean, the thing is, you could do it with something like, you know, a hydrogen maze or something like that. You can get a lot of power out of them. But you think you'd notice the other effects as well, such as everyone's phone's not working. And light sort of, sort of systems sort of switching on and off at random. And... and prickly, melty sensation in your skin, maybe. I think that yeah, probably will be fairly high on the list. Now, the video I watched yesterday is a chap standing down next to one of these masks, 5G masks, and he's measuring the radiation from it. Well, what he's measuring is cyber obliquage and possibly some other antennas on that mass, on that monopole, which are 3G and not 5G, because 5G specifically beams a very compressed directional energy beam at a target. He's definitely not measuring that. You can't measure that. I didn't think we had 3G on 5G masts. I'm fairly certain we don't anyway. We're turning 3G off. He can just say what he wants, of course. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, he's he's done this. He's done it again. He has established that 5G is safer, that people mm. that are near masts of 5G get less exposure. Yes. Yeah. Good job. Good job. <laughs> awesome. And they're safer. Thank you. Now, I wonder if you would care to speculate as to the identity of the person that Mark is referring to, who um, who he believes is is foolish enough to stand below or adjacent uh, a 5G mast and measure it with, with some kind of handheld device. Who would be idiot enough to, 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 to even try such a foolish thing? Well, off I have. Off confidence and definite. Which, if you play the next video, you will reveal the identity of the, uh, 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 the secret meter man. Up there, that 5G mast up there emits what's called a corona. It's an electrical discharge, so it's a collimated signal in air. And obviously we're measuring 3,000 down here. 2,800 there, 2,800, 2,000, 4,000. Characteristics from the antenna, the way that it's bounced around there all the time. See that? So that's pretty toxic. Uh, that'll reduce your life expectancy significantly. We've established. 2,000, 8,000, what? Gerbils, uh, I think meter, you didn't say the units. Well, it could be anything. I think whatever Mark's handheld device was measuring, it, it's such an inaccurately made device that the signal just fluctuates just because it's crap. Yeah, and I mean, also because people are walking past with their phones on and he's probably, it's probably being recorded with the phone, but, but he's, didn't he just say in the last video that you can't measure that? Yeah. A- exactly. He, yeah. Well, he said you can't measure it with a spectrum analyzer, but apparently you can measure it with that no, cheapest device on the market. AliExpress. Mm. Yeah, but so he's talking about 868 megs and then he's talking about 20 gigs and he's got this little round blob thing, which is antenna. What's the response to that antenna going to be at the extremes of the frequency range he's looking at? Don't, don't, don't. What's it Didn't you, you manage to, to review one of those? Yes, I, I had a look at one. It's um, And I tested it in, you know, in the basement, best I could do during lockdown times. Uh, I, I mean, it was terrible, really. Um, I think you'd get a better result with a potato, wouldn't you? Yes. Well, mm. I, you can just look at the yeah, manufacturer's the specifications. Yeah, the manufacturer's specs say it's plus or minus 6 dB. That's uh, a huge so it, it, could oh, that's be, a it could be twice as bad or two times better. Uh, so, so the, the accuracy is, is uh, it's, you, you wouldn't use it for anything serious. No. Yeah. But he's already debunked himself and said you can't do that anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. He said that your exposure is less. Good job. Mm. After watching Mark's video, do you feel, each of you, has he explained to us what 5G is? Do you now know what 5G has a gaping void in your knowledge of telecommunications been filled by this important lecture from one of Britain's most esteemed weapons scientists? I knew what 5G was before, and what he has said 5G is, is wrong, so... No. I think to me, 5G is a way that uh, telecoms vendors have found uh, to sell more kit and make more money. 
because everyone's got 4G and they ran out of things to sell. So they thought, we want to sell more stuff. People want more, more and faster connectivity. Let's make some new things. We call it 5G. Off you go. Thanks. People Give want us your money. faster cat videos. Well, I hope you too are now fully informed as to the true meaning of 5G. Is it a, a weapon that the IEEE -E -E define as beam forming through air? Or is it just a specification of a telecommunication system written by a bunch of beardy boffins who work at a conglomerate of a hundred companies? Well, I leave it to you to decide which of those extremely plausible things might be true. And in the meantime, I shall be preparing yet another video for Mind of Steel. And if you have something to say uh, about this exciting video that I've just produced, please hop on over to our Telegram. The, the link is right at the top of my YouTube page or leave a comment below. I'd love to know what you think. And uh, especially if I got something wrong, if you think I've made a mistake in this carefully produced episode, then hop over to Telegram and leave a, an audio note or a video. And if it's suitably entertaining, I will, uh, I will feature it on the next episode. Until then, have a great one and I shall be back with some more Mind of Steel.